on behalf of uh, Dr. Pauline Park, who is uh, not able to join us, a uh, speedy recovery to her. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce this year's Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Dr. Robert Bartlett. As you heard in yesterday's opening session, Dr. Bartlett developed extracorporeal life support, ECLS, from the lab through the first successful clinical trials to routine practice worldwide. Thousands have benefited from this technological advancement over the last several decades. It has led to a new understanding as well of the pathophysiology of renal, cardiac, and pulmonary failure, which provides the basis for much of modern critical care. His work has been recognized by awards from the Society of Critical Care Medicine, the American College of Surgeons, American Academy of Pediatrics, and American Pediatric Surgery Association, as well as membership in the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Bartlett is Professor of Surgery Emeritus at the University of Michigan, where he continues lab and clinical research to this day. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bartlett as he presents the well-deserved Lifetime Achievement Award Lecture, Extracorporeal Life Support in Critical Care. This is Todd. He's a gymnast at Indiana University. He's healthy one June day, dying the next of meningococcal sepsis. The next day, he's in my intensive care unit at the University of Michigan, uh, where his life is being supported by five artificial organs in the ICU. Now, you probably left two or three patients like this in your own ICU to come to this meeting, and you'll have them when you get home again. Uh, but at the time, that was, that was uh, pretty special to, to be able to do what we do every day. But isn't it great? The problem is it was not always that way. When I graduated from medical school in 1963, there was no ICU. There were no people who did intensive care. There was no way to monitor or ventilate a patient overnight. Uh, there was no drug or device industry in this field. There certainly was no textbook, no certification, no people who claimed to be experts at critical care, and no group of experts like the group that we're represented here today and all of you. So I had the opportunity to watch this specialty develop over 50 plus years. It all developed in my practice lifetime. Quite amazing what we have today. So I watched this develop it and had the opportunity to contribute to it on occasion. And it's so exciting to be here today to talk about some of that development. Thanks to Dr. Mickelson for the very gracious introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming to this, this session. Uh, I'm most greatly honored to be the recipient of this lifetime Achievement Award uh, by my colleagues and my uh, friends at Society of Critical Care Medicine. Thank you very, very much for that. Now, my achievement, uh, such as it is, is really like yours. I've just been taking care of patients one after another. Some of those patients are pretty sick, like Todd, and it's been my privilege and opportunity to be able to take care of the sickest of the sick patients over a period of time. I just fell into this. I've been most fortunate to be at the right time and the right place where all this is being developed with mentors that made it happen. For me, this started at a little hospital in Boston called the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, a 300-bed hospital uh, attached by a fistula across Shattuck Street to the Children's Hospital, which is a prestigious, legendary hospital. And in those institutions, the chief of surgery and my primary mentor was Francis Moore, and the chief of surgery and my other mentors, Robert E. Gross, at the Children's Hospital. And between the two of them, they wrote the book on the art and science of surgery. 
So I set out with six other young guys fresh out of medical school uh, with the hope to become a good surgeon. Now an ICU is a place where mechanical devices, artificial organs, are used to replace the function of other vital organs and the people who know how to run those devices and ways to monitor the patients who are being managed with those devices. Uh, but it's the devices themselves that make our discipline unique. The most widely used artificial organ is, if you think about it, the artificial gut. And it's interesting that Dr. Moore, who wrote the book on response to injury and pathophysiology, theorized that it ought to be able, ought to be possible to feed people in profound catabolic states to reverse that and make them anabolic, but he didn't know how to do it. It took two surgical residents at University of Pennsylvania to demonstrate that you could put very hypertonic fluids of sugar and amino acids into rapidly flowing blood in the right atrium, and it didn't clot, quite amazing. So they developed this entire discipline of parenteral alimentation, or TPN. This is Stan Dutrick. Years later, we showed that if you simply fed people in multiple organ failure in the ICU, they got better. Shouldn't have been a surprise, but uh, pretty radical at the time. The, the first ICUs were really the recovery rooms of places where cardiac surgery was being developed. And at the Brigham, the surgeon was Dwight Harkin, a bombastic guy, the first person to operate inside the heart. And some of those patients were so unstable that they couldn't be extubated. So they spent the night in the recovery room and pretty soon we had to add, we, they added an extra four beds in the back of the recovery room where those patients could be managed overnight. People came from Europe to see a patient who'd been intubated overnight. Wow, pretty exciting stuff. Now, the, the ventilator that we used for those patients was usually a bird ventilator, now considered an ancient device, uh, which was pressure controlled and uh, driven by spontaneous breathing on the part of the patient. In retrospect, we should go back to it because between then and now, we have all these fancy ventilators, all different ways of blowing into the airway, uh, none of which have accomplished too much. If you think, I mean, they're fine if your lungs are normal, but if your lungs are badly damaged, uh, the worst thing you can do is blow hard into the airway. I was privileged to be part of the ARDSnet group of some 25 years ago, and we demonstrated in that group that, number one, ARDS was a serious problem. Number two, if you blew into the airway with pressures over 30, it killed people. So the, the overall mortality for this ARDS, a condition described by, by Ashbaugh, a surgeon, uh, was about 30, 40%, and it still is. Here's the lung safe study from a couple of years ago. We haven't done much better than about 30 or 40% uh, mortality in ARDS. But I remind you that the artificial organ here is artificial breathing, not treating the lung. And the only thing you can do with a ventilator is damage. So you have to be, be careful in how you use it. And it's certainly not an artificial lung. That's still to come. At, that, at the Brigham Hospital, this is Willem Kolf, who invented the, the uh, concept of hemodialysis. And he escaped from Holland with four dialyzers, one of which he gave to John Merrill, who's the nephrologist at the Brigham Hospital, where he learned how to do chronic intermittent hemodialysis for patients in renal failure. Fantastic. Here's Dr. Marilyn, another one of my mentors, Joe Murray, who, because dialysis was there, invented kidney transplantation and re received the Nobel Prize for that activity. And dialysis, as you know, is wonderful. So if a patient has no kidneys or a patient who's in ATN from a dye injection or something, those patients live forever. But patients in the ICU who develop acute renal failure as part of a multiple organ failure syndrome had a very high mortality. 80 or 90% of those patients died, and the more you dialyzed them, the more they died. It had all kinds of reasons and problems for that. 
1982, a young German nephrologist named Peter Kramer presented a paper at the marvelous artificial organs meeting, which happens every year. And what he said was, look, I hooked up a hemofilter to an arteriovenous shunt and huge amounts of extracellular fluid came out so much I had to slow it down. Fantastic. And so uh, a few of us at that meeting, Emil Paganini and Claudio Ronco and I heard this and we thought, that can't be right. So we went home to try it and it was fantastic. The first time you saw continuous hemofiltration, you couldn't believe it yellow fluid came pouring out at, at a huge rate. Now, of course, it wasn't urine. It's just plasma filtrate, but nonetheless, it was pouring out. So we quickly learned that you could take a whole lot of it out, put most of it back with a substitute solution, but that can include unlimited nutrition for patients in renal failure. So this whole concept of continuous renal replacement therapy as a way to feed patients in renal failure all developed uh, in those ICUs in the, in the early 1980s. Right, Such? Such wrote the book on it. Now, the artificial heart-lung machine was invented by this man, John Gibbon, a Philadelphia surgeon, shown here with his wife and lab technician, Mary Gibbon. And they invented the heart-lung machine, did the first successful case in 1953, and out of that came the entire field of cardiopulmonary bypass and cardiac surgery, basically all of modern cardiology and, and uh, cardiac surgery developed from that single idea. But it was a pretty, pretty lethal instrument if you used it very long. If you added a membrane oxygenator instead of the raw gas oxygenator that Gibbon used, it turns out you could run extracorporeal circulation for several hours, a couple days, a several days. Amazing, really a, quite a remarkable change in the way that we could suddenly manage cardiopulmonary bypass. So veno-arterial circulation got to be part of our intensive care management armamentarium. The, those membrane oxygenators were made of silicone rubber at the time, and several labs were working on how to do that, how to make an artificial lung out of a gas exchange polymer. And that led to the development of uh, actual devices that you could use, hook them up to patients way back in the, uh, in the 70s. And that led to trials of this technology uh, compared to conventional ventilation over time. And what's remarkable about it is that you can control all the variables of oxygen delivery. You just dial them in, whatever you want them to be, which we never had the option to do in the past. And not only that, we could avoid all the things which we did use, vasopressors, vasoactive drugs, uh, and mechanical ventilators. So, so quite a remarkable step step forward for artificial lungs. So I mentioned Dr. Gross. Here's Robert E. Gross, who is the uh, chief of surgery at the Boston Children's Hospital in 1965. In the middle uh, aisle here are the senior residents. Here in the back are the junior residents. This is Alan Gazaniga, who, who you're going to hear more about later. And this is your speaker here. Uh, and uh, for for reasons related to the fact that Dr. Gross really liked my wife, I could address Dr. Gross. You never talk to him unless he talked to you, but I could, I could talk to him because the problem was that this was early pediatric cardiac surgery, and half of those children with major operations died postoperatively, usually in the first few days. So, so it was frustrating. So these guys in the back row are bagging those people with little ambu bags, but they, they died anyway. So I had the temerity to go to Dr. Gross and say, why don't we just keep these kids on the heart-lung machine? It works so well. Let's use it for a day or two, because we knew if they lived that long, they'd be all right. And that was great. Well, he said, uh, no, the reason they're dying is the heart-lung machine. If you use it for more than an hour or two, it's a lethal instrument. But why don't you work on it? <laughs> so that's mentoring. Why don't you work on that problem? And so uh, I, we, I, with others, set out to 
work on that issue. And the problem was, in fact, the artificial lung that was being used. And if you could build that device, gas exchange device, out of a, a gas permeable membrane, you, in fact, could keep animals alive for quite a long period of time. This is Phil Drinker, who's an engineer. And uh, uh, Phil and I built this device. And what do you know, we could keep animals on extracorporeal circulation for a few days, phenomenal. Now, there were three labs that were, a lot of labs working on this, but three major ones. One was run by Don Hill, who's in San Francisco, and one was run by Ted Colobo, and this is Ted Colobo, who spent his entire career at the NIH, and in, in that context developed the first really practical membrane lungs, the catheters that we use to treat patients, uh, working here with Warren Zapo, some of you know Warren, he's what was in the lab at the time, and uh, Ted was a marvelous guy, 20 years ahead of his time, and uh, really developed this concept of extracorporeal gas exchange and demonstrated that you could separate CO2 removal, which is breathing, from oxygenation, which is matching alveoli to the blood supply. So Ted had many wonderful people working with him, Warren Zapel, Uchano got to know him, he happens to be here, my old friend, thank you for coming, is uh, worked with him, especially on that concept of CO2 removal, uh, which, which uh, has which is still very much in, in the research focus and in the practical clinical focus these days. So we finished residency. And I mentioned Al Gazaniga earlier, who happens to be here with us. So we're um, get out looking for our first academic job, fresh out of residency. We thought we knew everything, and uh, we both went to a brand new medical school, University of California, Irvine, which was in Southern California. Now, from the viewpoint of Boston, Southern California is in the scientific hinterlands. If you asked Dr. Moore how to get to Southern California, he'd say, I'd probably go through Dedham. That was the, his approach to it. So it turns out, of course, that Southern California is as far as you can get from Boston, Massachusetts, geographically, intellectually, culturally, and politically. So, so we, we went from the far left to the far right just by moving across the country. But we had a marvelous time. So we got assigned the job, these young guys, of running the county hospital, a 600-bed hospital in the barrio, and uh, we were running it. So we were well-trained, but we did all the general surgery, cardiac surgery, thoracic, vascular, pediatric surgery. We set up ICU, we set up, we ran the OR, we ran the, the emergency room and just had a wonderful time. For 10 years, we practiced really what is now very old-fashioned surgery, but it was great fun, and we were pretty good at it. One of the things we did was carve out a building, in a, or clean out a building that was behind the hospital, and build a laboratory to continue this work on prolonged extracorporeal circulation. And so we got our first NIH grant in 1971. We still have that grant. And uh, we demonstrated that you could put sheep on extracorporeal support for as long as a week and nothing bad happened. That's all what, what this shows. So uh, quite phenomenal. A another resident friend of ours, a guy named Tom O'Brien, was operating and living in Santa Barbara, California and uh, had a patient that he'd oper on for, operated on for a ruptured aorta. He'd recovered, but was left with really severe respiratory failure, what we would now call ARDS. And he called us up and said, do you have that machine yet? you want to come up and try? I said, no, we're not ready for that at all. But Don Hill is. Don Hill's in San Francisco, not too far away. So Don came with his engineer, Maury Bramson. This is the Bramson membrane lung. It took six hours to assemble. It leaked and had all kinds of problems, but it worked. So here's this young man who's on VA support for only a couple of days. He recovered at the end of it, and this was the first patient 
who was uh, successfully treated with what we would now call extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO. Now, Al was a uh, was superb pediatric cardiac surgeon, and he operated on this little boy and did a mustard operation for transposition in 1972. Uh, but the little boy had profound cardiac failure immediately following the operation, what we would now call myocardial stun. So we thought, we'll bring our machine over from the lab. We sort of cleaned it off. We brought it to the hospital and hooked up this little boy on VA bypass. And over a short period of time, he rapidly recovered and was a normal, happy, healthy child. I always show this picture because he has pink lips, a very good result from his mustard operation. And what we, what we did to, to take care of that little boy was this. You recognize it's just a stripped down heart lung machine. So we cannulate the right atrium through the jugular vein, drain blood, anticoagulate it, oxygenate it, remove CO2, warm it up again and put it back into the systemic circulation, uh, veno-arterial access in, in a child. We did a few of those cases. A few years later, we were called to see this little girl who was a newborn infant. You can see pretty happy, healthy, full-term baby who had PO2s in the teens, clearly dying of hypoxemia. We weren't quite sure what was going on. Uh, well, she, her mother, uh, just a girl herself, was in the country illegally, was told that her little girl was going to die, and she left. We never saw her again. So we thought, so the neonatologist asked, remember, we're the pediatric surgeons, you guys want to try out your device on this baby? So we consulted the IRB, think we should do this? Yeah, let's do that. So that's what we did. <laughs> and we hooked her up to venoarterial arterial access through her neck, and she recovered. The nurses named her Esperanza, which means hope in Spanish, and we were off to uh, successful management of this one particular diagnosis, neonatal respiratory failure, which in those days and even today is a big problem. So this represents the number of cases over time and the number of centers involved with developing this uh, technology. And once we demonstrated that we could do this routinely with happy, healthy children, despite the fact that their neck vessels on one side are ligated, we did more of it and other groups at Richmond and at Pittsburgh learned how to do it. And uh, the whole project moved to the University of Michigan in 1980. While there, we ran courses in how to do this. Most of neonatologists thought this was crazy. You don't want to get involved with that. You know what they're doing in Michigan. Oh, God, it's terrible. But there were young neonatologists who had babies that were dying in their ICU. said, wait a minute, we better go learn about this. So we ran courses on how to do it. Nowadays, we have great simulation. <laughs> the simulation was we put two sheep on bypass in the morning and two in the afternoon. That was the, the simulation that taught people how to do this. And we... Uh, only ask them, if you go home and if you decide to do this, let us know how it goes. Let us know what's happening with your patients. So by 1988, there were 700 and some cases, mostly neonates, that had been managed in these various centers with quite, quite remarkable results, considering that these are babies who everyone thought was going to die otherwise. So that registry, as it turns out, uh, turns out to be very important. I learned that from Joe Murray, the guy who developed kidney transplantation, because early on he said, we need a registry of these patients. We need to know about what happens so we can decide if we're doing it well or badly, should we continue and so on. So we did the same with patients that were managed with this extracorporeal technology treatment. In 1989, we gathered all those people, and this is the first meeting of ELSO, the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization, which was held in Ann Arbor, and the people who were just using this bizarre new technology. And now ELSO has grown so that there are 700 member centers around the world, and this technology is being practiced uh, everywhere, and this is a map of the member centers of, of ELSO. Uh, there are five chapters of ELSO nowadays on five 
consonants, and what ELSO does is keep track of what we do, publish guidelines on how to go about it, certify centers that are good at it, uh, and most importantly, maintain the registry. So that registry is now over 100,000 patients, and we track the patients by age and by diagnosis, primary pulmonary or cardiac, or flat out cardiac arrest and eCPR. And you can see that the survival of patients on ECMO is quite good compared to the alternative. About 10% die while they're still in the hospital, something we need to address. Uh, but uh, enough information to say, okay, this technology, when it works, is valuable. So this represents the number of cases and the types of cases in the registry uh, over the past 20 years or so. So the number of neonatal cases dropped down when nitric oxide came on board, but stays about the same, about 1,000 cases a year. Pediatric respiratory cases started going up about 2008. Adult respiratory cases really started going up in 2008. Cardiac support cases has always been there for neonates, but now is more frequently used for children and especially for adults with profound cardiac failure or cardiac arrest. These are just the eCPR cases all since 2008. What happened then that changed uh, the use of this technology around the world? Here's the types of cases in the registry. Back in 1990, it was 90% neonatal. Now that's less than 5%, and there are a lot of older children and adults with respiratory failure and older children and adults with, with cardiac failure. Just looking at the last five years, since all that growth has occurred, almost half the patients in the registry have been in the last five years of time, almost 50,000 of them, and you can see that the neonates and the pediatric cases are significant, but the greatest growth has come in adults with pulmonary or uh, cardiac failure. And again, the survival rates are not 100%, not even 80%, but pretty good. But nonetheless, they, this demands some type of clinical trials to decide if this is really as good as it looks like it is. So for most of that time, this is what ECMO was. And for those of you who were participating in it back then, I'm sorry, you remember what it was like. You lived at the bedside, people bled, people died. People said, why are you doing this? Every now and then someone would survive and made you feel good. But in 2008, two companies from Germany decided to build an ECMO device. Before that, there wasn't any. You had to get something from the OR and something from your garage and something from here and there and literally put it together. And, and it was amazing that it worked at all. Uh, but once, once a couple of companies built devices that were very safe, very reliable, didn't break, uh, and you could just hook it up and literally kick it under the bed, then all this changed. So so now you could use this technology, but use it in a way that was a little more practical as, uh, as you went along taking care of patients. And that precipitated a huge change in how we took care of these patients. Those of you who were involved 10, 20 years ago probably remember this, patients who were sedated, maybe even paralyzed, lying flat in their back for two weeks of time, and, and if one recovered, that was great. But once we have this new technology, these patients can be managed awake, breathing spontaneously with a tracheostomy or maybe no airway at all. They can now be managed by an ICU nurse who has to be there anyway with a little help from a specialist who knows how to troubleshoot it if that needs to be done. Uh, we <laughs> have learned, as I said earlier, when you blow into the lung, bad things can happen. And so you try to recruit the lung, but the best way to do it is don't do it, just watch and wait. And sooner or later, it'll probably get better. And bleeding, which used to be the major problem, is still the most common problem, but now it's an irritating minor problem, which is rarely a fatal problem. So where this stands now is we use this technique. We, we talk about ECMO or extracorporeal life support. 
interchangeably, and we use it for cardiac support, for circulatory failure from any reason, or for respiratory failure, and we can use VA or VV access. I'll talk about that in a minute, but the key to it is once you get the patient hooked up, how do you manage the lung? How do you manage the patient? How do you manage the nutrition? How do you manage the ventilator? And how do you know when and how that patient's going to get better and how to how to appropriately take care of them. For cardiac failure, this has become very simple. The patient has a profound circulatory failure for because of septic shock, myocardial infarction, myocarditis, cardiac arrest, whatever it is. Hook them up in veno-arterial mode and you can perfuse the whole body very well, including the heart and the brain. And after a day or so, find out how's the brain. If it's okay, great, you're halfway there, how's the heart? If it's working some, that patient's gonna recover over six or seven days and they'll be all right. The heart's not working at well after three or four days, it's never gonna work. So now the question is, is that a heart transplant candidate? If the answer is yes, then start planning for a VAD, switch over to a VAD, uh, which is much easier to manage, and start planning for a transplant. If the answer is no, for, and there are lots of reasons why a patient might not be a heart transplant candidate, so now you're on a futile course. So you have to talk to the family, talk to the patient, and decide when you're just simply going to turn it off. Talking to the patient's a problem. Here's a patient with cardiac failure. His heart's not working at all. He's on VA bypass, in this case through the neck, alert and awake and functional. So it's hard to say, gee, I'm, really, I'm sorry, uh, we're not going to do this anymore. This particular patient went on to a VAD and ultimately uh, recovered completely. So for respiratory failure, you can use VA bypass and it works fine, uh, but it does involve access to the arterial circulation, so it has the runs the risk of stroke and you have to sacrifice an artery in the process. So uh, starting way back in the early 80s, various people, including our lab, developed double lumen catheters. So you can drain venous blood through one lumen pump it through a membrane lung and perfuse it back through another lumen into the right atrium where it mixes with whatever venous blood did not go through the circuit and winds up in the arterial circulation. Because it's mixing with the venous blood, it's never going to be like normal arterial blood. It'll have a saturation of 80 or 90, something like that. Uh, but nonetheless perfectly adequate to sustain oxygen delivery for the patient. We monitor the things in these boxes with those numbers we can calculate oxygen delivery and all that sort of thing and use this to manage a patient with respiratory failure on ECMO. Now for cardiac support, uh, this, this, uh, no one ever worries about where's the randomized trial. If your heart doesn't work, you're dead, I'm sorry. So if you hook it up and can get it going again, that's worth doing. But in respiratory failure, it's a serious question. I'm a neonatologist, I'm an adult pulmonologist, I know how to twiddle these dials. If you just had me take care of that patient, they'd be fine, they don't need this fancy machine, and it's, a, it's an appropriate question. So there have, in fact, been 13 prospective studies uh, with comparative groups being conventional care uh, with regard to ECMO in, in uh, pediatric and adult applications. I'll just tell you about a few of them. One is a neonatal study done in the United Kingdom in which is a plan for 300 patients. After 180 patients were randomized, the survival with conventional treatment was 41% survival. In the ECMO group was 72% survival. Highly significant. Everybody said, okay, that we, that's, that's proof we don't need to do that again. But that left uh, adult patients and pediatric patients still to be studied. So there have been a variety of studies. The one you probably have heard about is a so-called CSER study, an acronym for something uh, done by Richard Furman and Sosnowski and Giles Peak in Leicester, England. The same group that did the neonatal study. So they did this exactly the same way as the neonatal study. Patients in a lot of different ICUs were randomized if they met criteria, either to stay where they were or to go to Leicester, where the ECMO Center was, and get treated there. And this was the difference in survival of the 
ECMO center patients versus those with conventional care. The this, this study uh, was uh, ended at six month follow-up, but most studies in ARDS are limited to 28 days. So this is the 28 day difference, highly different. And there are aspects of this study that you could wonder about, but still uh, pretty well prove the point. Another way of doing this trial is by a matched pairs trial, compared patients with treated one way versus a large group of patients treated another way. That happened, uh, again, Noah is an investigator from Leicester, England, but they did this for H1N1, just that one diagnosis, and compared those that were referred to ECMO centers to those that were not in ECMO centers. Pretty significant difference. Uh, last last month and last year, but quite recently, this trial was published, the EOLIA trial, a randomized trial of uh, venovenous ECMO for ARDS. Elaine Combs, who's a, a brilliant investigator in Paris, was the, was the principal investigator. Uh, Elaine is at Hôpital Saint-Pétrière-la-Pitié, just love to say it, but it's a, it's a big hospital in Paris where the, one of the biggest ECMO centers in the world is. And they did this study in a series of centers. Uh, out of 1,000 patients with severe RDS, patients were randomized to either go to early ECMO as soon as they met criteria or to stay on conventional care. Uh, and the this was powered to detect a 20% difference between treatment failure in these groups and treatment failure in the ECMO group was 35% and the conventional care was 58%, highly significant difference. So the DSMB said you've proved the point and the investigators stopped the study. However, when they looked at the actual survival, some of these patients were managed with ECMO as rescue therapy late in the course of management, many of them during cardiac arrest. And so nonetheless, some of those patients recovered and survived, 43%. So the uh, comparison between early ECMO at 65% survival and late ECMO at 43% survival is not quite statistically significant. So we have these two conclusions you could draw from this study. Nonetheless, my interpretation of this study is if you, if you use ECMO, it, it's probably good. You shouldn't do that. And that's what the editors of the New England Journal said. This is probably pretty good. Uh, but if you're going to do it, do it as soon as the patient's failing, not six days later as rescue therapy. So the respiratory support algorithm is considerably more complicated than the cardiac support algorithm. You start out with maximal support, lots of blood flow, wake the patient up after a couple of days, titrate the flow to give just enough oxygenation to, to treat the patient whatever they need to match their oxygen consumption, and then the whole game is played in knowing when and how to wean the patient off. Now a lung transplant surgeon who's in San Francisco at the time, Chuck Hoops said, why should these patients be in bed? He's bridging these people to lung transplant. So uh, they're not candidates for transplant if they've been lying flat in their back for two weeks. Get them up, let's take them to rehab. Let's feed them meat and potatoes and get them up and around. And in fact, that works. And it's become pretty standard management now, rehabbing these patients beginning in the first few days of Expo Sport. Polly Palmer, who's at the Karolinska in Stockholm, asked the question, why should these patients be asleep? Well, I don't know, they're sick, aren't they? They ought to be asleep. No, 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 wake them up. So, and I didn't believe this, but I went to visit Polly, and here's this kid, we're playing Nintendo. He has no lung function, he's totally supported with ECMO. And this, this leads us to where we are now with this technology. This is one of Polly Palmer's patients, just looking at the tidal volume on the ventilator, there's none for a month and a half. And we used to just quit after 12 days, 14 days, 20 days or something, but knowing Polly Palmer, yeah, we just keep going, no problem. And what do you know, the lung gets better, all back to normal in a matter of a week or two. Who would have guessed that this can happen? And in fact, it happens a lot. So there in the registry, hundreds of cases now that have been on VV ECMO for more than 21 days, both adult and pediatric, 
published some series from pediatrics, some in adults. The latest papers just last week came out with 27 patients managed at shock trauma in Baltimore, 87% survival. Who would have guessed that that could happen? Incredible. And there are case reports of 30, 40, 50, 100, 193, 605 days of being on ECMO with recovery at the end of it. That's this, this uh, little girl here and her doctor. So here's what's new. The, the lung can recover back to normal after weeks or months, years of no function. This is new biology. This is new information. It's just made possible by the fact that we can keep these patients alive for quite a long time. And there are, in fact, hundreds of cases. So now we're in the process of redefining what we think is irreversible lung injury. And we've learned that the lung has unexpected regenerative capacity during prolonged mechanical support. It, the lung can recover after months of what seems to be irreversible lung injury. So this offers exciting new scientific opportunities. How does this happen? Why does it happen? When does it happen? How do you identify the patient who's going to recover two months from now versus the one who's not going to and might instead go to transplant or something like that? And this is where the science is going in the next 10 or 15 years, we'll know the answers to all this and be able to turn it on and turn it off and, and learn a lot about it. It also introduces new, very practical problems. These patients are sitting in the ICU. And as I said earlier, you might have one of these patients in your ICU, you still gonna be there when you go back home and pay back your colleagues for all the time you're here. And, and uh, when is that patient going to recover? And more importantly, he's taking up a bed in your ICU, a uh, very precious, expensive bed. So how, what, how can we deal with that particular problem? Well, with this new phenomenon, we, we have to deal with right ventricular failure, which we never used to deal with. We used to say, if, when the right heart fails, they're going to die, and that's the end of it. Now we've learned that's not the case. So uh, we do have these late recovery patients if you have a way to manage the right-sided failure. So how can we get ECMO out of the ICU? Well, the answer is wearable or implantable artificial lungs. And there's several labs and several companies that are working on this. If you think about it, there are a couple of ways of doing the vascular access. One is conventional venovenous ECMO with a double lumen catheter going on for a long, long time. That's probably not, that doesn't deal with right-sided failure. You might go from the right atrium to the pulmonary artery with a pump or from the pulmonary artery to the left atrium with the oxygenator being driven by right ventricular pressure. So a lot of groups have been working on this concept. We've worked on a big group in Osaka's working on it. And it has been done clinically. This is the first patient like this, a patient in Regensburg, Germany. This is Dr. Aloy Philippe. And this is a young lady with cystic fibrosis who got worse, was on ECMO, and then converted to partial support. This membrane lung is hooked to her pulmonary artery and left atrium. And she's finally well enough to go off to Munich, in this case, to get her lung transplant. This is Reese, the little girl I was telling you about, and Chris Nelson, who took care of her for 600 days. And after a couple of months, he's in right ventricular failure. So their approach was to cannulate the right atrium and the pulmonary artery and hook it up to a membrane lung with a centrifugal pump. And she was on this device for 15 months of time, during which she's alert and awake, going to school with her classmates and ultimately recovered at the end of it. So this is where we're headed. Uh, in the United States, there's only one such device that you can buy, which is made by a company called Leva Nova, formerly Tandem Life, a centrifugal pump and a membrane lung that can be hooked up to a double lumen venovenous catheter or actually to a catheter that goes right into the pulmonary artery. There are groups at University of Pittsburgh and University of Maryland, Michigan, and a lot of other places, several in Germany, working on this concept. And so that's what we think this will look like five or 10 years from now, these patients will be on VV ECMO for uh, about two weeks. And if they're not better, most of them will get better, but if they're not, they'll go to a place that's capable of extubating the patient, ambulating, transplanting them, or putting in a wearable lung, hoping for late recovery, 
or maybe someday this might even be a destination, it's a permanent artificial lung. So in summary, where, the, where we will stand about 10 years from now, these patients will be alert and awake, breathing, extubated. The indications will be not 80% mortality risk, but something much earlier, maybe 50% mortality risk based on very specific algorithms for either cardiac or respiratory failure. We should be able to do this without systemic anticoagulation. The systems will be automated so you don't have to see what the venous sat is and turn the flow up or down. Some computer will do that for you. And uh, for the applications for cardiac failure, will be in shock of any cause bridging to heart recovery or probably bridging to VADs and other type of cardiac replacement. Uh, and for respiratory support, these will be patients who are bridging to recovery with perhaps implanted devices done in lung centers and implantable lungs. So uh, Esperanza, the little baby I showed you earlier, uh, we've stayed in touch with her. She's here at the age of 21. She's now 40 something and has children of her own in college. And uh, Todd, the young man I said was on the, the gymnast, was in fact the, the gymnasts at, I, at Indiana are also the cheerleaders during football season. So here's Todd, he's well enough to lead his team uh, onto the field for the football game. It happens that the Indiana-Michigan game happened to be in Ann Arbor that particular year. So we're very proud of the fact that he's running out onto the field and uh, there's a sad end to the story, which is no matter how hard he cheered for the Indiana football team, <laughs> Michigan won the game. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found that interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you so much. Thank you.